extremely loud and incredibly close. As I started thinking about tonight's call and asking the Lord what he wanted to say tonight, he reminded me of the movie Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close. I think it came out in 2011. I know I watched it as soon as it came out because um, as a therapist, it intrigued me. So the Lord reminded me of that movie. And the movie is about a young boy who had Asperger's syndrome. And so the movie was given that title, Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close, because it emphasized the heightened sensitivity that comes with Asperger's. I don't know if any of you know anyone that has been diagnosed on the autism spectrum, but those diagnosed with Asperger's tend to be very sensitive to sound and to light, to physical space, to certain textures, all of those things. So when the Lord gave me, reminded me of the, the title of that movie, I thought it was quite random. Like, okay, God, what am I supposed to do with that? But as I pressed in more, God connected the title of that movie to John chapter 8. So I'm in the book of John chapter 8 tonight, and I'm going to read the first 11 verses. John chapter 8, and I'm reading the first 11 verses, and I'm reading from the Passion Translation. The Passion Translation. John chapter 8, 1 through 11, the Passion Translation. And it reads, Jesus walked up the Mount of Olives near the city where he spent the night. Then at dawn, Jesus appeared in the temple courts again, and soon all the people gathered around to listen to his words. So he sat down and taught them. Then in the middle of his teaching, the religious scholars and the Pharisees broke through the crowd and brought a woman who had been caught in the act of committing adultery and made her stand in the middle of everyone. Then they said to Jesus, Teacher, we caught this woman in the very act of adultery. Doesn't Moses' law command us to stone to death a woman like this? Tell us, what do you say we should do with her? They were only testing Jesus because they hoped to trap him with his own words and accuse him of breaking the laws of Moses. But Jesus did not answer them. Instead, he simply bent down and wrote in the dust with his finger. Angry, they kept insisting that he answer their question. So Jesus stood up and looked at them and said, Let's have the man who has never had a sinful desire throw the first stone at her. And then he bent over again and wrote some more words in the dust. Upon hearing that, her accusers slowly left the crowd one at a time, beginning with the oldest to the youngest, with a convicted conscience. Verse 10, until finally Jesus was left alone with the woman, still standing there in front of him. So he stood back up and said to her, Dear woman, where are your accusers? Is there no one here to condemn you? Looking around, she replied, I see no one, Lord. Jesus said, Then I certainly don't condemn you either. Go and from now on be free from a life of sin. So for those of you just tuning in, I just read John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11 from the Passion Translation. And I felt led tonight to talk about the extremely loud and incredibly close love of God. Come on, somebody. The Bible says that this woman was caught in the act of adultery. And she was brought to stand in the middle of the crowd that had gathered to hear Jesus. Imagine that. She was caught and she was brought to stand in the middle of the crowd if she was caught in the act, people of God, it stands to reason that she was either naked or she was very scantily dressed at this point. And they brought her in that condition in the middle of the crowd. And nakedness often symbolizes vulnerability. 
It symbolizes exposure. It symbolizes shame. And in Genesis chapter 3, verse 7, the Bible says that Adam and Eve, when they realized that they were naked, they felt ashamed. So nakedness brings with it a sense of shame. So no doubt this woman was standing there in the crowd, feeling ashamed, feeling vulnerable, feeling exposed. And the Bible says that just as he did for Adam and Eve, when they, when they realized that they were naked, it was in that moment that God drew close to them to engage them in conversation. He did the same thing for this woman that was caught in adultery. And people of God, his love for us is extremely loud, meaning his love for us is not quiet. It cannot be hidden. It is scandalous by its very nature. God's love for you is scandalous by its very nature because truth be told, you and I have done enough for God's heart to turn pitch black and stone cold towards us. We've done enough that would cause his heart to turn that way towards us. Yet he loves us relentlessly and he loves us recklessly. And when we think about it, there are people who have done far less to us than we have done to God. Yet we've fallen out of love with them. We don't care about them anymore. Oh, this person broke my heart. Oh, this person wasn't faithful. This person wasn't loyal. We have done so much more than that to God. But when people do that to us, we cut them off. But there's a song that says, I think the, the words say, Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it. Still, you gave yourself away. And I need you to understand tonight, people of God, that the love that God has for you is an overwhelming, reckless, scandalous kind of love. Jesus' love for this woman was loud. It screamed at the consciences of her accusers, and it chased them away. The Bible says one by one her accusers left, from the greatest to the least, from the pastor to the pew member, from the oldest to the youngest. Why? Because Jesus' love for her challenged their sinful consciences. He said to them, let him who has never sinned, never messed up, never fallen short, let that person cast the first stone. And because of this statement, which really was his love for her and protecting her, their guilty consciences started to scream, and they had to leave. And God's love for you and me tonight, people of God, has screamed in the face of our accuser, the enemy, as he stands before God day and night, accusing us of sins that we have committed. Every time the enemy stands before God and says, remember what she did. Remember what she did yesterday. Did you see what she just did? God's love for us, God's forgiveness screams in the face of the enemy. And people of God, regardless of the report that the enemy gives to God about what you did last night, or what you did today, or what you did a couple minutes before this call, God's love screams in response. He loves you regardless. He loves you in spite of. He loves you even though. He loves you nevertheless. He loves you anyway. And I need somebody to receive that tonight. Even as I'm teaching, I just sense that there's somebody on the call that has been struggling with even believing that God loves you. And I want you to receive that tonight. And God's love for us is not only incredibly, extremely loud, but it is incredibly close. It's incredibly close. God's love often comes uncomfortably close to anything that we want to hide. You would think that he would not want to come close to the things that are disgusting, the things that we're ashamed of, the things that we want to hide. But his love comes uncomfortably close to anything we want to hide. He draws near to us in our mess. He doesn't say, okay, go clean yourself up and then come and talk to me. He draws near to us while we're still dirty. And Jesus did not stand far off and address the woman in her sin. He came close enough to her to engage in an intimate conversation with her. I don't want you to miss that tonight. He came close to her and he said, where are the people who brought you here? 
is there anyone around who condemns you for what you did? And when she said no one, when she looked and she saw no one and she said no one, Jesus said, then neither do I. Neither do I. And somebody needs to hear that tonight. God is speaking a neither do I over you. I have dealt with all your accusers is what the Lord is saying. I have dealt with all of those that have come to condemn you. And neither do I condemn you tonight. And there are those of you on the call who struggle with a spirit of condemnation, never feeling good enough or worthy enough. There are people in your life who live to remind you of where you're, where you're coming from, what you did, who you were last year, what you did when you were in your teenage years, all the mistakes you've made. There are people who live to remind you of that. And it causes you to have a spirit of heaviness and a spirit of condemnation. And there's somebody on the call tonight where your accuser is you. You are your own accuser. You can't forgive yourself for what you did. You can't let go of the mistakes of the past. And so you're flooded with regret and self-blame. Nobody else has to accuse you in this season because you are accusing yourself. But God's love is literally drawing you extremely close to him tonight. I want you to receive that. Jeremiah 31 verse 3 says, With loving kindness I have drawn you and continued my faithfulness to you. People of God, he pulls us in when our actions deserve him to push us away. He does the opposite. And this woman caught in adultery did not experience rejection or abandonment in Jesus' presence. When those Pharisees brought her to Jesus, they thought he was going to reject her and abandon her. But instead, his love came extremely close. Close enough to pardon her sin. His love came even closer for us people of God. So his love for her came close enough to pardon her sin. But his love for us came even closer because the Bible says he became sin for us. Come on, somebody. The closest you can get to a thing is to become it. And he became sin for us. His love for her drew her close to him. But his love for us caused him to become sin for us. His love for us has pushed him extremely close. And that's the only way that we could regain intimacy with God. The intimacy that Adam and Eve experienced before they sinned. Because Jesus died and took on sin for us, we're now able to experience the intimacy that Adam and Eve had before they sinned. I want you to think about that tonight. Because of their sin, they lost intimacy. Despite our sin, we gained it. Come on, somebody. We are talking tonight about the extremely loud and the incredibly close love of God. I want to read for you Ephesians chapter 3, verses 16 to 19. And I really am falling in love with the Passion Translation because it's, as the name suggests, it sounds so passionate. And even as I'm teaching on the love of God tonight, this was the translation that the Holy Spirit led me to. And so I wanted to read Ephesians 3, verse 16, verses 16 through 19 from the Passion Translation. And it says, and I pray that God would unveil within you the unlimited riches of his glory and favor until supernatural strength floods your innermost being with his divine might and his explosive power. Then, by constantly using your faith, the life of Christ will be released deep inside you, and the resting place of his love will become the very source and root of your life. I want, I'm going to say that again. The resting place of his love will become the very source and root of your life. Then you will be empowered to discover what everyone experiences. The great magnitude of the astonishing love of Christ in all its dimensions. How deeply intimate and far-reaching is his love. How enduring and inclusive it is. Endless love beyond measurement that transcends our understanding. This extravagant love pours into you, thank you God, until you are filled to overflowing with the fullness of God. Hear with the word of the Lord tonight, people of God. This extravagant love 
pours into you until you are filled to overflowing with the fullness of God. This kind of love holds you accountable to your actions, people of God. It cannot be that God is pouring out this extravagant love on us and all we do is accept it. No, this kind of love holds us accountable. You can't just live any old way or do any old thing with this kind of love. You're held responsible for this kind of love. And Jesus told the woman, go and from now on be free from a life of sin. He didn't just cover her with his love and excuse her. He said, go and from now be free from a life of sin. This kind of love, people of God, demands a holy life in response. A holy life. It demands an extremely loud and incredible, incredibly close life in response. If he loves us in an extremely loud and an incredibly close way, then we ought to love him in an extremely loud and an incredibly close way. How do you love God extremely loud? You love him in such a way that your life screams Jesus to those around you. You don't even have to open your mouth. But in how you dress, in your attitude, in your actions, in your conversations, your life screams Jesus. They see him. They hear him in your, in your response to them. They see him. They sense him. That is how you live out loud for him. And how do you live incredibly close to God? People of God, we cannot live an extremely loud life without an incredibly close life. We can't shout Jesus in public but live far from him in private. Come on, somebody, because there are many of us that are guilty of that. We can go to church on a Sunday and we lift our hands and we shout and we cry and we sing, but then we don't meet with God in private. We don't have any quiet time. We don't have any private devotion. How is your intimacy with God tonight, people of God? Do you spend time in the secret place? Are you bored when you get into, into quiet, pr quiet, private moments with him, when you start praying for two minutes, do you get bored? Do you get bored when you start reading his word? Are you watching the clock to pass the time? Is spending time with God just a thing to check off on your to-do list? The kind of love that God loves us with demands that kind of love in return. Psalm 25 verse 14 says, There is a private place. A secret place reserved for the lovers of God, where they sit near him and receive revelation, secrets of his promises. Have you made use of this private place, people of God, this secret place? Have you sat near to him to receive revelation, to receive secrets of his promises? You know, some people have argued that the woman caught in adultery was Mary Magdalene. And that she became a disciple of Christ after that encounter because she never wanted to be apart from him. And that's how an encounter with God leaves us. We want more and more and more of him. We never want to be apart from him. I don't know about you, people of God, but I cannot live not one day without the love of God. This world is so mean, it is so harsh, it is so cruel. You deal with people who are unforgiving, you deal with people who are vindictive, you deal with people who don't love you for who you are, you deal with people who just are opportunists, they just get close to you for what they can get. I need the love of God. I cannot function in this world with its superficial love and its superficial connections. I need the love of God. And people of God, one day we will have to stand naked before God, just like the woman with, the, with the, the woman caught in adultery. We will have to stand before him completely exposed. And we will have to give account of every act that we have committed and every word that we have spoken. And my desire on that day is to hear him say, I don't condemn you, instead of hearing him say, I never knew you. Come on, somebody. And even as the Bible says that Jesus had knelt down and he started to write in the dirt, I believe that Jesus' writing in the dirt was symbolic for so many reasons. And one of them, that one of the reasons that came to me as I prepared tonight's word was that he was writing a new declaration over that woman's life. We were formed from the dust, people of God. And as Jesus wrote in the dust, the very thing that she came from, I believe he wrote her destiny. 
I believe he rewrote the ending of her life, not the mistake that she had just made, but the new ending of her life, the new chapter of her life. And he is writing on us tonight. The Bible says that we are written epistles. So how will you respond tonight, people of God, to his extremely loud and his incredibly close love? Some people push it away because it's too much. It's hard for our human minds to comprehend why a God that is so holy and so perfect would love us as intensely as he does. And so sometimes it's hard for us to accept his love. It's hard for us to wrap our minds around it. Some people end up pushing him away. But how will you respond tonight? And I'm taking my time to teach this because the Lord told me, even as I prepared this call, that this word is not for everybody. He said, this word is for the remnant. When the Bible says many are called, but few are chosen, this word is for the chosen few tonight. Not, the, not, not, not everybody. Because not everybody is willing to press in to experience and encounter that kind of love for God. And not everybody is willing to press in and try to love him in the same way. So this word tonight is for the remnant. It's for the chosen few. And my question to you tonight is how will you respond to this extremely loud and incredibly close love of God? Let's go to God in prayer. Father, tonight, I just thank you for being so passionate and so intimate, even in this word tonight. I thank you, God, for how you broke it down and just helped us to understand just the length and the breadth and the depth and the width of your love I thank you tonight, God, for your love, a love that does not mind facing scandal to embrace us. You are the one who went into the homes of sinners, and you didn't care that the Pharisees gossiped about it. You didn't care what people would think about you because you sat and had dinner with tax collectors, and you spoke with prostitutes, and you went over here and dealt with drug dealers. You didn't care what people would think your love does not mind facing scandal to embrace us. And God, tonight we thank you because the truth is many of us, you had to enter into a scandalous situation to rescue us from where we were and to bring us into where we are today. And God, we thank you. We thank you that your love will chase us down wherever we go. The song says, there's no shadow you won't light up, no mountain you won't climb up coming after us. There's no wall you won't kick down, no lie you won't tear down coming after us. And we thank you tonight, God. You know, Father, we have all had the experience of people loving us for what they saw on the outside and then rejecting us when they got to know us better. But tonight we thank you that you knew everything about us and you chose us anyway. You knew everything about us, all the mistakes that we made. You knew everything about us, and you chose us anyway. You embraced us in our mess. The Bible says the prodigal son walked right out of the pig pen and into his father's arms. He said, the Bible says he came to himself when he was in the pig pen. It never said, and he stopped and went in the house and took a shower and then went to his father. He left right from the pig's pen and went straight into the arms of his father. And truly, God, you have embraced us in some smelly, some messy, some dirty, some confusing, some embarrassing situations. Even as that prayer request just went up for someone who needs healing for their heart and wanting to know to be able to forgive themselves and to receive your love, you have embraced us in some really dirty, embarrassing situations. And we don't know where we would be without you tonight. You are the keeper of all our secrets. If people were to know some of the things that we have done, they would never speak to us again. They would never listen to us again. They would never even look at us again. You are the keeper of all our secrets, Father. You are our hiding place. For some of us tonight, God, you are our home. You are our home. And we love you tonight. We love you with all our hearts tonight, God. And we just pray that you will help us to walk worthy of the love that you have shown us and continue to show us, God. Help us to walk worthy, God. We, call, we pray, God, that you even cause us to love you incredibly loud. Incredibly loud and extremely close, God. Cause us to love you incredibly loud and extremely close in return. 
Father, we even come against every assignment of hell. A lot of times when the word of God goes forth, the enemy begins to manifest. If there is a spirit that we are contending with, if there is a if there is an attitude, a mindset, a feeling that we have been struggling with, when the word of God comes, it is a sharper than any two-edged sword, so it begins to pierce. And sometimes as a response to the piercing of the sword of God's word, we have certain manifestations. Some of us can't breathe. Some of us start coughing. Some of us start sneezing. Some people even throw up. It is a manifestation of the word of God penetrating that area, that situation deep in your heart that God wants to break up, that God wants to sever, that God wants to move. And so, God, even as you're manifesting your, your deliverance, thank you, Holy Spirit, even as you're manifesting your deliverance on this call, I pray, God, that you cause us to be open to receive what it is that you are doing. There has to be a response to the word of God. And so I pray, God, that you teach us how to love you in this way. Let us not be those who worship you in public, but have no private time of intimacy with you. Cause our love for you to be extremely close. Father, you said if we draw near to you, that you would draw near to us. And tonight, as an act of our will, we draw near to your throne. With hearts of love, with hearts of gratitude, we seek your heart tonight. We are more concerned, God, about seeking your heart than your hand. Tonight, we're not coming to you to ask you for anything other than your heart. We want your heart. We want more of you, God. Now we ask you tonight to take us deeper. We ask you tonight to bait us in. Cause us to launch out into the deep, God. We want to fall into the depths of you tonight. Deeper than our feet could ever wander. Cause us, God, to go deep. And even as your word says that deep calls unto deep. Cause deep to call unto deep tonight. I even pray now, God, for a stirring up of the wellspring of our hearts tonight. You said that the water that you give us will become like a well springing up into everlasting life. And so I pray tonight, God, that there will be a troubling of the waters in our souls tonight, God. Cause there to be a swelling of the waters, God. Let us begin to feel the stirring. Let us begin to feel the shifting, God, even in our spirits. Because we want to experience the fullness of your love. Your word says that your love will be poured into us until we are filled to overflowing with the fullness of God. Fill us up tonight, God. Some of us are dry. Some of us are parched. We need to be flooded by your love tonight. Fill us up tonight, God. And even as you baptize us in your love, cause that same love to be like a purifying fire in the name of Jesus Begin to burn away anything in us that is not like you in Jesus' name. As fire purifies gold, begin to purify our hearts tonight, God, in the name of Jesus. Purify our minds, God. Purify our thoughts. Purify our desires. Purify our appetites. Purify our will, God, and our emotions. We ask you to purify us tonight, God. Have your way in our lives. Have your way in our lives, God. You are preparing an army that is without spot or wrinkle tonight. You are preparing a bride that is clean, that is pure, that is holy. Purify us tonight, God, in the name of Jesus. Even as we take up our reserved place in your presence, we ask you, God, to reveal your secrets to us. Reveal your mysteries to us, God. Lovers share secrets. And even as you are the lover of our soul, Begin to share your secrets with us, God. Share your heart with us tonight as we press in and as we seek you. People of God, this is the part of God that not many people experience because they're not willing to press in. This is the part of God, the part where he begins to love on you, the part where he begins to whisper his secrets to you. This is the part that not many people experience. And so, God, I ask you tonight to meet us in our pursuit of you. As the deer pants after the water brooks, so longs our soul and pants our soul after you. And I pray tonight, God, that you satisfy every longing of our hearts. People of God, that longing of your heart cannot be filled by a spouse. It cannot be filled with more money. 
It cannot be filled with a new job. It cannot be filled with a new house or with a new car. It can only be filled by God. And I ask you tonight, God, just to satisfy every longing of our hearts and continue to write your words over our hearts and our lives. Continue to write in this dust. Thank you, God. Continue to write in this dust tonight, God. Write your words in this dust tonight, God, in the name of Jesus. Father, I even break off even now every spirit of guilt, every spirit of shame, every spirit of condemnation, every spirit of regret in the name of Jesus. I break it off your people now. The Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation, no guilty verdict for those who are in Christ Jesus. So every lie of the enemy that has your people feeling that they are not forgiven for sins that they have committed. And I feel that strongly for somebody on the call tonight. You keep on repenting over the same thing over and over and over again. You keep repenting for the same thing because you don't feel forgiven. Hear me tonight. Nagging guilt is not of God. Nagging guilt is not of God. If it continues to nag at you after you have repented, it is not of God. And we take authority over it now in the name of Jesus. The Word of God says in 1 John 1 verse 9 that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So once you have asked God to forgive you, it is done. And the enemy has you condemned where you're constantly crying over the same thing that God has already forgotten and forgiven. And what you do, people of God, when you keep bringing it back up to him, is you keep reminding him of what you've done. Because he casts your sins into the sea of forgetfulness and he remembers them no more. So when you go back to him and you're like, forgive me again, God, he's like, for what? And then you tell him, and he's like, oh, I didn't even remember that you did that. Because I forgave you when you asked me last week. So God, I break off that spirit of condemnation that has your people repenting in, in repentance cycles over the same sin. Even though they haven't done it since. We break that cycle now in Jesus' name. Or we release, we release God that no guilty verdict, that not guilty verdict. Thank you, God. We release that not guilty verdict over your people's hearts and minds tonight in the name of Jesus. There is therefore now no condemnation. There is therefore now no guilty verdict to those who are in Christ Jesus. So, Father, cause your love tonight to begin to penetrate those areas those hardened areas of our hearts, those of you on the call who do not forgive yourself for that abortion, come on Holy Spirit, Jesus, for that abortion, for the fornication, for the time that you stole money, for the time that you did, you, the things that you have kept as a secret, things that have happened that nobody knows about, that you don't want to share with anybody, and you're bearing that guilt. The Holy Spirit says to tell you that you are forgiven in this season. You are released in this season. You are holding yourself as a prisoner in a cell that God is not the, the warden of. He is not the warden of that cell. Thank you, happy wives on purpose. Secret sins. God has already forgiven you, people of God. And this is why he had me teach on the love of God tonight. The extremely loud and the incredibly close love of God. You are forgiven. Hear the word of the Lord to you tonight. You are forgiven and you are made free by the blood of Jesus Christ. No longer bound, no longer in chains, no longer bound by the sins that you have committed. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Receive the word of the Lord to you tonight in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. I just break the back of condemnation. I just break the back of a guilty conscience. I break it now in Jesus name. I break it. I bind the hand of the enemy now in the name of Jesus. I bind the hand of the enemy now in Jesus name. And I just speak life. I just speak life over every person on this call. Let it go, people of God. Let it go, people of God. Even now, as a prophetic act, this is what I want you to do. If there is something that you have been holding on to, that you have not been able to forgive yourself for, and it is tormenting you, as a prophetic act, 
I just want you to exhale right now, wherever you are. I just want you to exhale. I want you to let it out. I want you to just exhale. And as a prophetic act, that is a symbolism. That is a, re that is a reflection of us letting it go letting it go. The enemy will not use that situation to beat you up. Not one more day in the name of Jesus. Be healed, be delivered, be set free in Jesus name, in Jesus name. And I guarantee mercy me that by the end of this call, you won't be having any breathing troubles anymore. It's a manifestation. But God has broken all the yokes tonight. He has destroyed every yoke and broken every chain. And you are free by the blood of Jesus and through the love of Christ. Through the love of Christ. Receive his love tonight. In every area where you have felt unloved and unworthy, receive the love of Christ tonight in Jesus' name. So, Father, I cover my brother my sister under your blood. I don't know why you led me in this direction tonight, God, but I thank you for confirmation. I thank you for confirmation, God, that the people that needed to hear this word were on this call. You told me that this was not for everybody, but this call was for the remnant and the chosen. And I thank you, God, that your word has not returned to you void, but that it has penetrated the hearts of your people. So, God, I pray that you set a guard now over the word, because any time you have planted your word in our hearts, the enemy will try to come to dig it up. And we pray tonight, God, that you will set a guard now over the seed of the word in the name of Jesus. Set up a hedge of protection, a fence around the word, God, in our hearts so that we will hide it in our hearts and not forget about it when the enemy tries to come. The David said, thy word have I hidden in my heart that I may not sin against thee. So God, I cover them under your blood tonight and I decree and declare sweet sleep and sweet rest in the name of Jesus. I pray you speak to them through dreams tonight, God, and confirm this word. Everywhere they turn, I decree this and I declare this, even for the rest of this week. Everywhere you turn, you will hear about the love of God. You will experience the love of God. You will read about the love of God. You will hear songs about the love of God. I just decree and declare that the love of God is going to bombard you everywhere you go this week in Jesus' name. In the mighty name of Jesus. So God, we give you glory tonight. We give you honor and we give you praise. It is in the mighty and the matchless name of Jesus Christ, the lover of our souls. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. People of God, I pray you receive your deliverance and your encouragement in Jesus' name. I did not know that this call was going to turn into a deliverance call tonight, but I knew that there was a reason God had me teach on the love of God. Receive it tonight, people of God. Receive it in Jesus' name. I love you guys. I am praying for you. Continue to keep the midnight cry prayer call lifted in prayer. And by the grace of God, we'll be back on the prayer call again on Thursday at midnight Eastern Standard Time. 11 p.m. Central Standard Time. To God be the glory that you feel lighter, Nikki. You exhaled it and it is now gone. Mercy me, do a check, please, and tell us if your breathing is back to normal. We're going to wait for Mercy me to testify. Do a check, inhale, exhale, and tell us if your breathing, if you're still on the call, tell us if your breathing is back to normal. We're going to give mercy me a couple of seconds to check in. Amen. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. Thank you, Father. So I love you guys. I'm praying for you, and I'll catch you on the call on Thursday. God bless you.